Good afternoon, everybody. Um, follow that. As I said, I won't attempt to follow that. That was absolutely um, brilliant. I had an inspiring um, science teacher, Mr. Grogan, who certainly changed the way um, I looked at the world. At one point, I was going to become a scientist. I trained as a, um, as a geneticist many years ago in, um, in Edinburgh, and I worked as a geneticist for a bit until I got seduced to the dark side, um, which in my case meant I ended up working in, um, in science TV. And I've been making science television programmes for um, 30 years. When we put scientists in front of the television camera, very occasionally... I feel, and probably they feel, that they haven't performed completely up to their best. Um, it's a feeling I sometimes get if I go for a, um, a job interview or I'm applying for funds or something. I sometimes come out of there and think, you know what, I could have done better. And most of us get absolutely no training in how to do our communicating. Um, and what we decided to do about 10 years ago as a television production company um, was to do some training primarily for working scientists. So I should um, introduce myself properly. Um, that's me, I'm Paul. Um, we're based in Leeds, and I've been running Screenhouse Productions there since 1991. I think that what we do as, um, as television producers is actually rather like what you do as teachers. So forgetting the embarrassing uh, non-playing video, we're always thinking about how we work with different audiences. Um, how do we get and keep attention. Um, if you've got a, a, a remote control and you, and you can change channel every five seconds, how do we make sure that if someone comes into our program um, at any moment, that they're going to be gripped um, and stay there to the end? One of the great problems with science is, especially if you're presenting for a general audience, um, is how on earth do you make science relevant? And I think that one of the great challenges, we heard um, earlier this afternoon, um, that so few people go into physics, I think maybe they can't see what physics is about. Worse, they don't know what a physicist is like. Um, you guys, by, by, and, and as you heard, teaching physics is doing physics. You guys are fantastic role models for what physicists could be like, and, and other scientists too, because you are not what people think scientists look like. They think they look a bit like me. Um, an older, middle-aged bloke with a beard um, is what you often see um, represented in the media. So we work very hard to, um, to break those stereotypes, and I think that you can do the same. Now, if you come to um, my workshop this afternoon, we're going to be doing um, a storytelling workshop. Um, I'm going to help you to do what we actually do. Um, I'm going to want you to think about physics and other science like a journalist would. If you look at a headline in a newspaper, if you went, if you went to WH Smith's this morning and took a look, you would be able to find five headline stories immediately. And in five words, which is what a typical Daily Mail or Daily Express um, headline is, you would have the story absolutely there. What we're not very good at in science is getting to the guts of a story immediately and getting attention. Now, newspapers have to do that because otherwise they die. If you go into WH Smith's, it makes a, it makes a real commercial difference to them if you pick the Independent or if you pick the Daily Mail. So writing a great headline and communicating a story instantly is the business of the media. Now, I'm not saying that you should think like Daily Mail journalists all the time, and, and, and probably a lot of you might even hate the Daily Mail, but the tricks that they've developed over the last 150 years or something are things that I think you can apply to the subjects that you teach. Because what we spend a lot of time doing is introducing stuff and setting it up, and what I think you should... You, you should do, or at least could do sometimes, is to get absolutely to the heart of a story. Now, it's difficult because, I mean, th th that little clip I was going to show you um, uh, is only five minutes long. And we've got three stories in there. We've got breaking a wine glass with sound. We've got how sound waves are used to break up kidney stones. Uh, and we measure the speed of sound underwater in the harbour in Cardiff. Um, three great demos. But they only take five minutes. So how can we squeeze that amount in? And the answer is by simplifying, which is, which is something else that journalists do all the time. A front-page newspaper story on the Daily Mirror is kind of that long. That's all the space they've got. So can you get the absolute essence of science down into a few words and throw away the rubbish? That's what we do. And the third thing that they do is newspapers get to the really good stuff first. So normally when you tell a story, it starts once upon a time, 
and then it ends with a dramatic conclusion. Strangely enough, newspapers completely throw that away. And in the headline, they tell you what happened, which you might think would spoil the story. Actually, it doesn't, because it's so short, it makes you want to find out the detail and learn more. So actually, putting the good stuff first, which is what newspapers do in a headline, is a great trick that we use when we talk to professional scientists. Now, this afternoon, there are actually going to be two of us. Victoria um, is stuck on a train and will be here um, in about 15 minutes. She is a professional actor, and if you are devotees of um, Emmerdale or Hollyoaks, you may have seen Victoria at various times. She tells me she mainly gets typecast either as an anaesthetist or a prostitute. I don't know what the connection is. Um, but anyhow, Vic Victoria will be here shortly. When she's not acting, she is a voice coach all around the world for big corporations, people like L'Oreal. They think nothing of having all their board members trained in how to communicate. You guys stand up in front of classes all day and may not have had much training in how to use your voices. So we thought we would bring that here today. So it's, it's, it's what we do for scientists and what we can do for, um, for science teachers as well. So what we're about overall, whether it's on TV um, or in front of classes, it's about passion and communication and inspiration. And we think that the tools that we've learned are things you might find interesting. So I hope to see some of you um, in our workshop this afternoon. And if not, um, we do run um, a series of courses, including ones with these two great science communicators um, who we can bring to, um, to the courses that we run. So if you see me around this afternoon and are interested, do come and say hello. Um, otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And also, congratulations to you on being um, hopefully inspiring physics teachers too. Thank you very much. Oh, an incredible thing has happened, everybody. Um, with one minute to go, I'd just like to introduce Victoria. Vic, I've, I've, you, you don't have to say anything. Thank Sorry. You. Um, so Victoria is going to be in here running a couple of, um, uh, of the voice workshops this afternoon. Breathing. So if you have, breathing. if you have voice on your badge, you'll be with Victoria. Uh, well done, Vic. Hello. Thank you. Really, apologies. Broken down train. Horrendous nightmare. Backup trains. Everything. I've run from Marlborough, so I really apologise. I wasn't here before. But lovely to meet you all. Thanks, Vic. So hopefully um, we'll, uh, we can spend a little bit of time with some of you this afternoon um, telling you about how we analyse stories for better communication and how you can um, project and protect your voice. So thank you very much and we'll see you later. <laughs>